Hello, welcome to Into the Abyss podcast. I'm here with uh, Jared again, and we're going to have a conversation about meaning, and we're going to solve all the meaning problems in the world. So if you are looking for meaning in your life, you've come to the right place. Isn't that right, Jared? Absolutely. I've got it all solved. Good, good. All right. Why don't you uh, share your credentials so that we know how uh, qualified you are? My credentials are that I don't really have any at all relating to this topic. Not even nice. Um, my, my background is in psychology, so you would think I might have some background in something like meaning, but I really don't, other than reading a few books, listening to some lectures. Um, complete novice, still trying to figure things out. Sounds legit. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, cool. So, um, this is the uh, beginning of all of this uh, saying, first of all, uh, I want to get you on. Uh, well, there really wasn't any reason. I was just like, hey, I want to talk. But the excuse for getting together was uh, that we were having some conversations, um, a lot of them revolving around, uh, around meaning. Um, and this is kind of ongoing for a number of years, I guess. But uh, um, some... Uh, lectures on YouTube by John Verbeke were kind of the the latest of a series of of different things. And uh, I guess one of the things that he addresses, I guess as a thesis that we can start off with, is that there's a meaning crisis um, in society, uh, both, I guess, at the level of individuals and in society broadly, um, that people are lacking meaning and that this has a lot of implications that um, need to be addressed. Is that a fair description? Yeah, absolutely. There's a meaning crisis going on. Uh, it causes lots of social issues. Um, a lot, you know, he claims that it's kind of broadly accepted within academia that there's a meaning crisis. I don't know how true that is because that's not my, um, that's not where I am in academia. I'm not among people that would talk about something like that. Um, but, you know, the type of things are, you know, like the ongoing opioid crisis, um, increased suicide, you know, like right now is the, the first time in American history where like your expected, uh, what is it, your expected lifespan is actually going down right now. And that's like the first time in American history, right? And it's just like, kind of feels like something is off, something's wrong. And perhaps that's led to like nationalism. Um, you know, nationalism is a way that people find meaning. Um, and so perhaps like, you know, 2016 was, you know, not just in America, but also in Europe and many parts of the world. Um, what else, you know, there's video game addiction is, is increasingly becoming a thing. And that's like another place where people can like find meaning or like kind of as an escapism. Um, but yeah, I don't know how new it is, you know, before video games, there was fantasy and sci-fi for many generations that people were very into that. Uh, I mean, you know, who knows? Like, it, it's not something I'm like historically like. I know I don't know how people thought about meaning. Right. Yeah. Well, and I guess those things um, in themselves aren't necessarily a problem, right? But I guess uh, a uh, unhealthy uh, obsession with them that uh, maybe they're not being applied um, in an appropriate way or in in a proper context. Um, and, and yeah, I guess that's one of the questions that I have about the whole thing is. Uh, is this something unique? Is is it something that's recent? Um, and it, as I think about it, it seems like there's always uh, something, <laughs> always something that uh, is going to be causing angst uh, for people. But you know, you did mention something that is objective: uh, the uh, lifespan um, decrease. When when did that start? I know I'm asking you just to recite off the top of your head, but I, I hadn't heard. It. Well, I had heard of that a little bit, but I don't know much about it. Yeah, I, I don't recall exactly when it started, but I think it's, if I understand correctly, it's mostly caused by the opioid crisis and suicide. But I, I'd have to look into it a little bit more. I mean, don't take my word for it. Go look it up yourself. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So it's like an average, the average um, decreasing because, because of that? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, that would make sense. Um, okay, uh, well, you know, that's at least a one objective marker that there is... Uh, there is some type of problem. And uh, yeah, I have seen, 
the, their de meaning is definitely something that's been addressed uh, throughout history. And I think we'll talk about that a little bit, uh, you know, even going back to ancient wisdom. Uh, some things in the early 21st, not that there's anything else, in the 21st, early 21st century um, and uh, 20th century, um, I was thinking of three authors who talk about meaning um, very directly. So, um, well, I guess uh, John Verbeke, he has written a book, but uh, um, the main thing I've heard of recently is this YouTube series. Um, and does it have a name? Yeah, it does. It's called, um, yeah, isn't it called Awaken Awakening from the Meaning Crisis? Okay, I, I didn't know if that was the name of the whole series. I know that was the uh, the first episode, at least. But and we can go. Yeah, we can say that's what it is. But it, it seems seems applicable, um, at least to to the whole series. Um, and uh, so he's one. And then uh, uh, Jordan Peterson. There seems to be some affinity there. He has a, a book called Maps of Meaning: Architecture of Belief. So that's another one that's um, uh, addressing meaning. Um, and then probably the most famous uh, is uh, Viktor Frankl, um, mid 20th century, Man's Search for Meaning, where he is definitely one who places a big importance um, on meaning, um, giving what I'd say is a, an attention grabbing example of, uh, since he was, uh, was he in Auschwitz? He was in a concentration camp, right? Um, and uh, his, from his own uh, personal history, uh, he noticed that, uh, people who uh, survived um, versus didn't survive. Uh, in, certain, uh, in certain instances, it, there seemed to be just kind of a, a loss uh, and despair uh, for those who just kind of gave up, like they didn't see any a purpose and meaning anymore. So that was, that was uh, the first story. And then he gets into his, his theories of the psychology behind that and, and how meaning plays an important role um, in life. Been a long time since I've read that, but that was just one that that came to mind of this ongoing conversation uh, about the importance of meaning. Uh, have you have you looked at all into Verbeke's book Zombies in Western Culture? No, he, so I'm I'm only on episode eight of his fifty-one part YouTube series, so I'm I'm by no means an expert in Verbeke, um, but he does mention it at least once but I, I don't even know what the thesis is. I, I don't know what it's about. Well, tell you what, how about I just read the summary? Because that's, that's my only exposure to it as well, but it sounds kind of interesting. Um, and uh, I think it touches on what we're talking about here. Uh, so this is, this is just from the summary on Amazon. The essential features of the zombie include mindlessness, ugliness, and homelessness. Verbeke argues that these reflect the outlook of the contemporary West and its attendant zeitgeists of anxiety, alienation, disconnection, and disenfranchisement. They trace the relationship between zombies, and they, he has co-authors. They trace the relationship between zombies and the theme of secular apocalypse, demonstrating that the zombie draws its power from being a perversion of the Christian mythos of death and resurrection. Symbolic of a lost Christian worldview, the zombie represents a world that can no longer explain itself, nor provide us with instructions for how to live within it. What's interesting about a lot of, uh, like Verbeke and, and Jordan Peterson in particular, is that they're, how they draw on symbolism and myth. Um, there seems to be something about myth that people find meaningful. And like going back to what I was saying about, you know, video games and sci-fi and fantasy, right? Like those are very mythological, you know, type things. And there seems to be a connection between people who, like, People who feel that they have lost meaning or that there is a meaning crisis seem to kind of always go to myth as like kind of the first step. I find that interesting. Yeah. And I still don't know. I have some ideas around like what that, why that is, but it's not, not quite fully formed. Yeah. Oh, well, and, um, I've only listened to a couple of the videos, um, episode one and seven. So seven was the one on Aristotle and the first one was the introduction, but, um, he, he says something about it, it, social technologies or something like that, um, that, uh, have expanded, uh, human capacities, which makes sense, uh, for me. Um, I mean, just like regular technology, uh, uh, physical devices expands human capacities, the social technology does that as well, maybe even at, at a cognitive level. Uh, but myths seems to do that. It um, helps us to um, 
think things that we might not otherwise be able to, uh, yeah. ideas that we would not otherwise be able to express. Yeah, his term is actually psychotechnologies um, because he's building on the idea of the extended mind. So the extended mind thesis is that, you know, we, we typically think of our mind as just existing within our head, but there's things that we do in the world that kind of expand our capacities, like writing, um, simple act of writing, or like, you know, when you're doing math equations, like it's too difficult to do it in your head, so you do it on paper, right? Or you use a calculator. All of these things kind of expand our capacities. And so some philosophers have argued that there isn't really a meaningful distinction between what you do in your head and what you can do in the world, so long as it's like you're extending your cognitive capacity. There's no reason to restrict that to just what you're doing inside your head. And so, we, and so Rebecca calls that cognitive, uh, or sorry, psychotechnologies. Um, and to kind of, what you were talking about is that myth kind of acts as a psychotechnology. Um, I can't remember who talks about it. I mentioned this last time we were on the podcast together. But there's one particular person uh, that calls culture a like the cloud, a cloud in the computing sense, right? Like, you know, Google Drive is kind of like the cloud. Like, you just kind of like store your information up there. Like, culture is kind of like that. You can kind of just like store information into the cloud of culture. Um, and that means like you don't have to fully understand everything about your culture or like um, specifically we can talk about like Chesterton, Chesterton Spence, right? which is the idea is that like, you know, there's certain rules that exist within a culture, but like no one really understands why they're there. So the idea is like you're walking in a field and you come across a fence. Like, do you know why there's a fence? Like, maybe not. Like you just see this fence and you're like, well, that's pointless and you knock it down. But if you don't know why there's a fence, you probably shouldn't knock it down. It could actually be there for a reason. And so culture can have these kind of arbitrary rules, but just because you think they're arbitrary doesn't mean they're actually arbitrary. There could be like free floating rationales to use the language, mm -hmm. right? That there's stuff in the cloud that, that isn't in our mind, but it's still meaningful and has purpose. Yeah, I think I, sorry, I, I uh, interrupted you there uh, when you were mentioning Dennett. So that, yeah, the free floating rationales idea from, uh, from Daniel Dennett, just to uh, reference that. I, I, um, sorry for the kids screaming in the background, just keeping it real. That's, that's <laughs> life. <laughs> we'll probably hear more of that. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and actually, I just wanted to mention a few, uh, um, uh, name drop a few things, just uh, mostly for uh, for people if they want to read more on it, not to just show uh, how much we've read. But <laughs> so uh, Daniel Dennett, you mentioned uh, the the free floating rationale. So the idea that uh, there can be um, an in, um, a logical structure to things that's not necessarily constructed by anyone um, that can exist even in nature. So he talks about that in his book. Uh, from bacteria to Bach and back. Um, and then the extended mind um, idea. Um, uh, I tie that mostly to uh, Andy Clark and uh, Chalmers. What's Chalmers, his first name? I can't remember. David. Um, David Chalmers, that sounds right, yeah. Um, and uh, uh, an example of uh, that they use is, um, so like uh, say a lady always walks around with a, a, a notebook and um, uh, you know, refers to it, or or a man who uh, has memory loss, uh, uh, Alzheimer's or something, but um, supplements his memory with his notebook. So he basically, he's still able to function um, uh, almost as well as normal. Uh, he just has to refer to his notebook to look things up. And, and that that's not all that different from the way we often are. Um, so Socrates was very critical of writing, which I, I guess would be right, why he never wrote anything. <laughs> but um, so he, uh, he thought, you know, we should just learn and memorize and retain everything in our head. Um, but uh, that's, that's pretty limiting, right? Uh, that uh, to have writing really expands our capabilities. And uh, on a daily basis, when I, I do remember a lot of things off the top of my head, but uh, a lot of times I'm going to Google it, right? Even if it's something that I was uh, familiar with before, um, or just to double check myself, I consider that uh, uh, resource as kind of an extension of, of my memory, uh, which uh, is kind of nice because uh, it's uh, much, uh, much less limited um, and, and something that I can access. And there was one other idea. Oh, I don't remember what the other one was. I was going to name drop some of those. But, um, now, yeah, and um, I think that, oh yeah, uh, on, on the Chesterton thing. Um, 
So uh, you talked about uh, Chesterton's fence and that. Um, and I really like that example. Um, and, and, and one thing about it is that it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't knock down the fence, right? Um, you still can, but uh, the idea being find out what its purpose was before you do that. Um, and I, I do like this attention that's being given to tradition. Um, so uh, Jonathan Haidt's another one who I would uh, point out as somebody who's really paying attention to a lot of classical thought and uh, um, ancient wisdom and ideas, um, not uh, for any type of mysticism, but just as in, hey, you know, these are some things that maybe uh, we should look at again that worked really well in the past and we can see why, maybe update them as needed. But um, uh, I guess what, what, I, what I'm getting at is that uh, even if we adapt the system, uh, say we, we see the fence, uh, we remodel, just understanding the way it worked before, having that comprehensive understanding um, allows us to adapt, utilize its advantages, and then update them according uh, to our needs. Because certainly um, uh, a lot of ancient ideas um, didn't address the problems that we have today because we have a lot of uh, things that they couldn't have imagined, um, but there still could be a lot that we could um, apply and appropriate from them. Yeah, you know, Verbinke calls myth, you know, myths aren't things that are fake. Myths are things that they're perennial patterns that are always with us, right? Um, and he actually talks, he says something interesting, which is that literature before the axial age, so this is like Egyptian, uh, Sumerian, you know, things like, um, who's the, uh, Who's the uh, the guy that the flood, the original flood before Noah? Um, oh, uh, um, like in Napushtim, in uh, Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh, right? Like those don't really speak to us um, because it's kind of like the myths of an age, like long, before, like so distant in the past that like the patterns that, are, that exist there just don't really resonate with us. But the literature that like starting with like Aristotle and Confucius and Buddha. Um, the stuff from the, the axial age around like 600 BC, like suddenly things kind of speak to us. Like from, from then on, the literature kind of is like made for us in a way. And that we still think like the people in 600 BC kind of thought, but we don't really think about, like we don't think similar to how the people in 1000 BC thought. And so the idea is like, you know, like even the myths that existed back then, like they still speak to us um, and this, you know, going back to like this idea of like myth as a psychotechnology, right? Like there's perennial patterns in there. Like there's Chesterton fences built into these myths. And it's like, you know, you, you watch a, or read a story, um, let's call it like the Iliad or something like that. And it's like, yeah, there's things in it that like kind of speak to you that you will kind of understand. It's like, yes, like I, this isn't really applicable to my life. I'm not in war. I am not, you know, there's, there's no gods that are like descending to earth and like influencing human life, but like there's still patterns in there that you can kind of pick up and you're like, yeah, like this pattern, this, this way of being kind of still applies to me in some way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, um, just to, uh, um, affirm what you were saying about, uh, yeah, that axial age switch where it starts to seem very relatable. Um, so, you know, I, I like reading a lot of old stuff. I, I read a lot of the uh, Hebrew Bible and that, and uh, um, that was definitely, that was uh, put together over, over many, uh, many different time periods. But uh, I've been reading recently also uh, uh, the Aristotle. So that's, you know, around 300 BC, a little later. Um, when I read Aristotle, it's like it could have been written could have been written last week. <laughs> it, it's 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 funny. I have to remind myself that this is somebody who, who uh, whose writings um, come from thousands of years um, before now. But uh, and uh, it's amazing to see that impact. That uh, how much of uh, our modern Western culture is um, rooted back then. It, it did uh, and what was the was there a thesis of why the axial age in particular? Um, is more relatable was there some some one feature of it yeah so he, he does get into that and i'll, I'll correct myself because i think the iliad is actually pre-axial age so i, so I may have so I screwed up my uh, like 
well, it may have falsified his reasoning right there that if people are still finding an Iliad relevant. Um, but he, he talks about that there was a whole bunch of psychotechnologies that kind of occurred around that time. Um, so if I remember correctly, like currency um, started, like, was became much more common, which got people thinking in abstract terms, like numeracy became a thing. Um, literacy became a thing where before like literacy was, you know, like Egyptian, um, you know, that's, you know, just characters per word and that's very cognitively difficult. And like your average person couldn't learn, you know, Egyptian, but like when it became phonetic, people could, your, any individual could just like pick up a book or anyone could learn how to read. Um, so I think there was like a few different things during that time that kind of, um, there was also like trade networks were becoming more solidified. And so it became less about like, you have a whole bunch of separate tribes that like only interacted through war and more like kind of a global community that's kind of forming. And you're trying to communicate with people across cultures and you're learning they are not the same as me. They're very different. And like the rise of cities. Um, so, so just like a lot of things that were kind of happening that kind of led to like a new zeitgeist that kind of like um, completely changed how humanity is. Yeah, yeah, that would make sense. Okay, um, so uh, getting back to the uh, the myths and the, the stories, um, What's an alternative to that? I mean, is is there a uh, is that necessary for everyone? Does it depend on the person? Um, so I'm just wondering because you know I, I I definitely like myth. I like stories, um, but then I, I I try to think. Okay, is it as necessary as uh, it's being made out to be, or can we have something that's uh, can we? Uh, have a life that's non-mythical, do we need to give some type of meaning to everything or can we just go about our daily business and leave it at that? Yeah, um, I have a few thoughts around that. Um, well, one is that the mindfulness revolution seems to be one way that people are kind of handling meaning crisis, that especially within cognitive psychology, there's been a real interest in kind of Buddhist techniques of being mindful. Um, and there's lots of stuff around it. Some of the literature is not that great. Um, and it's, not, it's not even clear, like there was one paper talking about like, it's, it's not even sure if the benefits of mindfulness are that much better than just watching TV. Um, but like people seem to find that really meaningful. Um, you know, may, maybe there's a signaling aspect to that, that like, oh, I'm the type of person that is mindful rather than the type of person to watch his TV, so there could be some of that as well. There seems to be a real interest in mindfulness, and, and there seems to be at least some literature that backs that up. Um, and then another thing, like, you know, different, there's different ways that people are trying to handle it, and not all of them are helping. There's video games and, and uh, you know, 4chan, you know, people getting involved in communities that are rather strange or, or quite bad, such as 4chan. Uh, but then there's also, I, I think the way that I would prefer to approach it is you kind of just have to bridge the is and the ought again. Um, and I think there's many ways of doing that. And to, to build. so the is and ought, the is ought distinction is the problem that exists that, that just because the world is a certain way, that doesn't tell you how, what you should do about it, right? There's, there's nothing inherent in the, in, the, in the universe, in the structure of the universe itself that says, Jared, you should brush your teeth in the morning. Like that's, that's, not, that's not how the universe is or that you shouldn't kill even. There's nothing in the structure of the universe that says, Jared, don't kill. Or at least that's the scientific worldview, right? Um, obviously there's a, a more theological worldview that would say, yes, there is the you know, structure of the universe, make God himself, um, but just because the universe itself doesn't kind of give us this meaning, um, doesn't mean I don't, like we can't adopt meaning. So, you know, we're born members of a community. We're born sons, daughters, brothers, sisters. 
and those roles kind of imply responsibilities. And I think that those roles that we inhabit should inform, it informs how we think about the world and what we ought to do. Yeah. Um, and so, and so uh, to name drop again, um, so David Hume's probably the most, uh, one that's most well known for making that distinction um, of the is and the ought. Um, and uh, it's a very uh, modern way of, of looking at things. And it, it makes a lot of sense, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, and like you mentioned, there, there are ways to push back on that and, uh, and uh, look at that. But um, a lot of, a lot of uh, thought developed uh, since that time. So David Hume was uh, 18th century, I believe, um, has uh, been responding to that, right? Um, how do you, how do you uh, get meaning? Um, does it have to come from the way things are or can you generate it uh, independently of that? Um, and uh, I've, uh, as, as we were uh, getting ready for this, I've been uh, rereading some of the existentialists because that's kind of, kind of their, uh, their gig, right? Is uh, uh, generating meaning um, independently. But um, I think, the communal aspect of that is, is an important point as well. I was trying to think, um, you know, could you really have a, a pure individual um, who's just completely uh, independently minded and doesn't refer, make any reference to uh, society and what's already there? I, I think that person would be pretty dysfunctional, <laughs> would probably be uh, uh, not somebody we would want to want to be around. Um, it, it would be my guess, but because uh, everyone, to, to at least some extent, um, modifies their behavior uh, and the way they interact um, in response to other people and the way things are, right? Um, uh, example I've heard is that, you know, when you walk into a classroom, say it's a college classroom or something, uh, it's probably best to kind of situate yourself and see, okay, what's expected of me here? You don't just walk up to the chalkboard and start giving the lecture, um, you know, unless you are the professor, right? Um, so um, Alistair McIntyre uh, is one who talks a lot about this uh, uh, communal uh, way of looking at things. Um, and he talks about narratives and characters so that in every narrative, uh, there are characters that you play also. So um, as you're looking at the narrative, you see, okay, what, what character am I? And then how do I fit? Um, into this narrative um, and uh, and go along with that. And I like to think that there's a bit of a, so I mean, cause that can, that can be kind of constraining, right? Um, and so uh, there's uh, in, in, in Maps of Meaning, Jordan Peterson talks a lot about these two ends where there's, there's kind of like the tyrannical narrative where there's no, no room to move. Um, and then there's also chaos um, and you have to, uh, synthesize both of those because uh, neither one is a, is a is a place that you want to be, um, and the the existentialist uh, idea that we can generate our own meaning is something that I find very appealing, um, but uh, I feel also like it has to be moderated a little bit, uh, maybe maybe a lot, um, by what other people are doing also, um, so that uh, you aren't completely um, uh, sociopathic, right? Um, so that you fit in um, with other people and have a, have a good quality of life. Yeah, the McIntyre idea of the narrative and character is very similar to Verbeke's idea of arena and agent, right? So you walk into a football stadium and it's immediately apparent like what it is and what's supposed to be happening. Like the lines in the field, you know what they mean. We have the, the goalposts, you know what those mean, their stands, and like everything in the arena, it makes sense. You know what's supposed to happen or what it informs. And that's not the world, and the is on distinction says, but that's not the world we actually live in. Like the world's not a football arena. It's not like things were designed for us to do certain things. Things are just meaningless and absurd. Um, but, you know, we can craft arenas. We can yeah. Craft is in our life where like things the way that the world is structured informs what we are supposed to do with it and it depends on what kind of agent you are right if you're a football player or a fan or a referee or a cheerleader but like you know 
that, that changes what you do in the arena, but the arena still has implicit meaning. Yeah, I mean, just a, 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 something being a, co a social construct it doesn't make it uh, a fake, right? It just means that it's constructed. This is, um, and this is why I push back a little bit, a bit against the idea of just a social construct. I think, um, uh, yeah, okay, there is a, uh, I, actually, no, I don't think that, that that needs to delegitimize or weaken something just because uh, it's a social construct. Um, many of the most important things are social constructs uh, and the uh, things that uh, we need to uh, pay attention to. Yeah, I, I like that idea of, uh, of the arena that as you're going in, um, you're learning the rules um, and, and playing by them. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think about um, revolutionaries in, in any type of discipline, um, they, they sort of play by the rules and expand on the rules also, you know, um, uh, and I probably shouldn't use football as an example. <laughs> uh, I, I'm sure there's ways that's done. But um, uh, but I was I was just thinking of chess, which I actually don't know a whole lot about either. But I was um, in. I've heard that uh, AI. Uh, one of the things that's been impressive about AI is that they've uh, uh, been able to make these moves that have just been completely revolutionary and uh, actually creative. Uh, interestingly enough for something that's not self-conscious um, but uh, still playing by the rules right They're, they haven't changed the rules of chess but they've kind of expanded on the subset of rules of, of like okay you know people have kind of known okay this is this is the way you do things these are the standard moves um, and uh, expert chess players will have a larger set that they can play with and then these uh, computers bring something uh, from completely outside that as well even though it's still uh, structured it's uh, it's breaking out of that a little bit but um, without the rules you can't couldn't even bring anything in novel you know if, if it wouldn't it wouldn't be meaningless at all like uh, if a computer just suddenly said duck uh, in in a chess game okay yeah that's definitely uh, thinking outside the box but it has no relevance at all to uh, to the game so uh, you need you need both sides of that there's my kids screaming again. <laughs> the constraints on the system are what make it meaningful. Uh, this is actually a conversation that I was having this morning with someone, which is that, like, freedom for what is kind of the question, right? Um, and especially in American culture, like, we very much prioritize freedom and liberty. But it's like, freedom for what? Like, freedom is like currency. It's 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 just something that you're trading for something else. Like if you're not doing anything with your freedom then your freedom has no value. And so the question is continue like freedom for what? Um, and this is kind of like, you know, consumerism is one of the, um, what, one of the common things that people blame for the current meaning crisis is that like we're in this having mode uh, and Vivek uses that term, which he gets from someone else who I can't remember. Um, but, you know, we're in this having mode where it's just like, we just need to get more and more stuff and we're consumers. I'm like, but that's not really a meaningful mode, not a really meaningful way of being. And so we need to like figure out like, what are we actually using our freedom and like, and our, like, our sum total of all resources? Like, what are we actually doing with that? And like, are we actually like, are we just trying to like get a bigger house or are we trying to like improve our community or are we trying to like, you know, be the best you know get a nobel prize or like what is it you're actually doing with your resources yeah uh you, you know this brings up a, a point um because you know so that's not meaningful so one of the things i was thinking about is uh what what is meaning right uh, i was trying to think of a definition um so uh i was just going on to merriam webster see see what the definition of meaning is uh, and of course this is different from semantic meaning right uh, we're talking about some type of um value and that's actually basically just what the definition gave. I didn't find anything really um, uh, insightful about it. Nothing against Merriam-Webster, I, I guess. I, uh, I mean, I think that works, but um, do you have an idea? Of, uh, I mean, I, I guess I liked that, that um, uh, meaning is something that ascribes value and that we can say, yes, this is something that I desire. This is something that I want. Is, is that what meaning is getting at? Or, or have, you, have you given that some thought? 
So Verveke builds on that a bit. You know, he talks about like, there's something about life that is like a sentence, right? And he's like trying to figure out what exactly that is. What it, how is it that life is like a sentence and that they both can have meaning? And it kind of goes back to this arena metaphor, right? It's like, you, you understand what everything means in the arena. You understand what, what the, the goalposts and the stands and, and all that, it all means something to you and it tells you what to do with it. Um, but when that's gone, then life is absurd, right? Which is the existentialist, you know, this, you know that, that's the specific word that existential is yes. absurd, right? It's just meaningless. But if you understand, like, if, if there is an ought in the is, which is what an arena is, where an ought and an is are combined, then it's meaningful because you know what to do. It, it's telling you what to do. There's meaning there. Yeah, uh, well, so uh, what I wonder then is, um, so with consumerism, for example, why can that uh, not be meaningful or is, is it a matter of degree? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, it, it kind of goes to the, the question of uh, existence versus essence, um, I think, um, which you're going to be better at explaining that than me, but I'll, but I'll take a shot. <laughs> I'll just set it up real quick. Uh, um, existence, essence. So this is uh, John Paul Sartre, where he uh, kind of gave a pithy uh, summary of existentialism that um, before we have an essence, we exist. Uh, so that's in contrast to an older idea where um, there, is an, uh, there is a human essence um, that even before we're born, what it means to be a human has all the meaning uh, packaged into it, where Jean Paul Sartre said, no, we just exist. And we're the one, it's up to us to define what our essence is going to be. Also related is the idea of the blank slate, right? So the idea is like, do you have a human nature? You know, and the fact that you are a certain way, so like it's kind of an is not distinction, but applied to yourself. Um, because of the way that humans are, does that, like, is there only one way for us to find happiness? Is there only one way for us to find meaning? Or are we kind of blank slates and we can kind of like find meaning in whatever we want to find meaning in? Can we find happiness in whatever? Um, like how, how constrained is human nature? A lot of debates, I think, ultimately come back to how people think about human nature. Um, so existence versus essence is definitely one of my kind of core interests because, yeah, like is, it's the is ought of yourself in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, well, and that might be where the difference lies. So like in consumerism, um, there could be the constraints of why there are limitations to how meaningful that becomes could be human nature, that there are human needs that uh, um, that satisfies partially, right? Uh, because we do it. Uh, there's definitely um, uh, an enjoyment from consuming. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. Um, but uh, there does seem to be limitation from that as well um, for a lot of people. I mean, I, I'm interested, and uh, I, I couldn't say one way or the other, if, if there are people who get like just complete fulfillment out of, uh, out of consuming and, um, and getting, getting good stuff, I mean, that, that might be the case. It, probably not, but um, anyway, that's, that's an interesting question. <laughs> Yeah, I tend to think not. Um, and, and so going back a, a few minutes, you know, uh, we were talking about constraints and like, what are we using freedom for? <laughs> this is this is a criticism that I've had um, of of sort of capitalism, specifically of libertarianism, and Ed Todd, you'll recognize this. Is is this idea that like, you know, you know, like we ha we want to choose a purpose, like we want to choose like our existential purpose. Like, what is it that we want to do? And maybe that's given to us by nature, but maybe it's something self-chosen. And the thing about liberalism as a political philosophy, uh, and I mean liberalism in the, in the broadest sense of the term, not, not in the American sense, um, is that like, it, it's supposed to grant you enough freedom to pursue whatever existential purpose you choose, right? Uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness doesn't tell you what the pursuit of happiness is. It doesn't tell you the pursuit of happiness is consuming things. It doesn't tell you the pursuit of happiness is to go to church and to raise a family. Like it doesn't tell you what the pursuit of happiness, it doesn't tell you what the existential purpose is that you have as human beings. It says you have freedom to choose. 
but with things like if you have a pure capitalist economy like some existential purposes are much harder to to obtain than others right like if you want to be you like if you, if you think your purpose in life is to be a great engineer, like capitalism is for you, that's great. But if you're if you're if you feel that your purpose in life is to is to be in theater and to act, like capitalism isn't so great for that, right? Um, I, I call it like I, I called it an existential constraint, right? The the set of existential purposes that you can give yourself is constrained when you're in when you're in a capitalist economy. Uh, which isn't necessarily a problem because maybe you do want to constrain people. Like you want people to be productive. You want people to contribute. Um, so I don't think that's actually a criticism. I, I think it's actually one of the strengths of capitalism is that it does constrain uh, your, your <laughs> the, the, the total, the sum total of all possible existential purposes that you could give yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it definitely, uh, probably uh, channels a lot of that into what produces uh, wealth for a society, right? That uh, we have uh, uh, sufficient commodities uh, for everyone in excess, really. Uh, so that, that I could see that that would be uh, one of the strengths. Um, but yeah, I, I think you're right that uh, we shouldn't look at that uncritically um, because uh, just because a system um, produces uh, and gives us uh, sufficient for our needs and beyond um, doesn't mean that it is satisfactory in every sense. Um, and maybe that there are ways to um, get uh, the good parts of uh, more than one, uh, more than one system. So what, whatever capitalism doesn't provide, and I think you're right that there are many, there are many uh, types of life, um, interests, and uh, sources of fulfillment that capitalism doesn't uh, value uh, as much uh, or facilitate. Um, and that's why we have a mixed economy, right? <laughs> uh, we're not, uh, and and uh, and we can take advantage of that. I think that's I think that's uh, worth. Uh, worth pursuing, uh, definitely. So yeah, that's one reason why I'm not um, libertarian anymore. Um, and uh, yeah, this is something that uh, Martin Hagelin in, in um, This Life talks about. Um, what, what is it, what is valued um, and how should we value things uh, uh, that, the, that maybe we need a revaluation of, of values. Um, less in the Nietzschean sense, but uh, more just looking at, okay, what is, fulfill, what is uh, fulfilling people's lives and how can we, um, how can we structure things to uh, facilitate that? Yeah, yeah, I, I think capitalism is definitely restricting and, and like you, that's one of the reasons I'm not purely libertarian is that I, I do want people to be able to pursue different ways of being in different life like uh, Ayn Rand's vision of, you know, John Galt. Um, I'm, I'm not so interested in that. And if certain people want to pursue that particular vision, that's great for them. But like, I don't think we should force everyone in society to be that way. Um, but at the same time, like we do need some constraints. Um, and I think constraints actually help with the meaning crisis because it, it directs you, right? Part of the meaning crisis is that you, you have, there's so many different directions you could go. There's so many different ways that you could find meaning um, that, that you just sitting there looking at every potential way that you could go in life. Like, what do you do? Like, there, there's nothing informing you what you should do. And the institution of society, and by institutions, I mean, you know, the government and church and school and also like the social norms, those informal institutions such as social norms. You know, like the sum total of all of the constraints on us, they kind of limit the set of existential purposes that we can choose for ourselves. And I think that actually helps with the meaning crisis. You know, like if you're Mormon, like you probably are less likely to go through a meaning crisis because like your purpose is kind of given to you since you were like eight years old. <laughs> and then if you're male, again, when you're at 12, um, and when you go on a mission. Um, and so there's all of these these constraints actually help us to 
narrow down what it is that we're supposed to be doing in life. And I think that's actually a strength. Um, it's one of the reasons that freedom can be overrated, right? Freedom's just the currency. But like, what you want is to give up your freedom for something. To spend, yeah, spend it like a currency. Um, yeah, it, and, uh, and I think if these, uh, if these uh, frameworks and narratives are so valuable, it brings up the question, um, then why aren't we just adopting them? Um, and I, I have an, uh, an idea of why that might be. It seems to be uh, uh, the meaning crisis goes back to a crisis of legitimacy of the, uh, the different narratives that, uh, so like if, um, uh, as uh, Verbeke mentioned, uh, Christianity uh, as a source of meaning before, well, why aren't people just taking that up, picking that up and applying it? Uh, maybe it's because there's some uh, uh, question of the legitimacy of it. Um, and, and similar thing for uh, liberalism. Um, it seems like liberalism is having, and, and so this is uh, uh, not uh, left liberalism, uh, but uh, uh, the liberal tradition of, of uh, democracy, uh, constitutional government, uh, uh, free, free markets, free trade, uh, freedom of speech, those, that type of, uh, of liberalism, all those values. Um, there seems to be a crisis of legitimacy for that as well, that it's not uh, giving the promises that uh, were expected of it. And so um, then people are looking for other things. So maybe nationalism uh, would be a, an, another source, trying to find something. Um, and it, it seems like when there is that crisis of the legitimacy of these of these narratives, these big ideas, that could be for uh, a couple reasons. Um, I'll, I'll mention two that come to mind. So one is that um, there's some doubt about the validity of it. So say somebody is in a religious um, upbringing and it provides all the meaning and satisfaction and there's no, there's no reason to push back against it but something comes up to question the validity of it. So like uh, it confronts some idea that calls into question um, whether this religious outlook is, is really true. Maybe it's not. And then that cascades and um, it's, it's no longer a viable option. And then the crisis of meaning ensues because the structure that gave the meaning is gone. Um, so that's one. And, or it could be the other way where the meaning just doesn't fit. So uh, somebody is somebody uh, is unique in a way that they don't fit into the system. So um, an LGBT person in a um, a religious uh, uh, Jewish or Christian uh, community where that doesn't fit into the narrative, well, then you're not going to be able to get meaning uh, from that because you can't. You're not a character uh, in that narrative. So then it kind of works in the other way where uh, because of the lack of meaning, it undermines the legitimacy and um, uh, validity of the narrative. Um, that there, there's my theory for why, um, uh, why people are not able to use the traditional narratives and, and why this uh, meaning crisis ensues. Does, does that seem plausible? Yeah, absolutely. I really like that. Uh, and they're not, they're not exclusive, right? Um, you know, we've talked about this before, but, you know, one of, like, there's really kind of two reasons that Christianity has been undermined. One is the scientific and one's the moral, right? The scientific being that no one just kind of, very, or not no one, but obviously increasingly people are less likely to believe in the, in the more extraordinary claims of Christianity, Judaism, Islam, um, and, you know, any religion that makes uh, any kind of supernatural claims. Um, and then there's the moral one, which is that as we move more towards, uh, you know, move, you know, LGBT being increasingly accepted, um, being more sex positive, um, and there's probably a few other, you know, moral shifts that have happened in the last hundred years or so that have just made the classic morality of Christianity to be less tenable. Um, and especially, and this goes back to the existence versus essence, right? Um, because LGBT is kind of considered, it's considered essence, right? 
it's it's not that you become gay, it's that you are gay. It's that you are transgender. That it's part of who you are as a being. It's not something you can choose, right? And so the since the essence of human beings is not compatible with Christianity, that undermines the whole project. Yeah. Yeah. So what um what can be a viable uh a viable narrative is narrative for the word we want to use for that um or a meaning giving um meaning giving framework uh i, I forget what what term we want but um what can be a uh, a viable uh narrative to provide meaning in these days yeah I, no we touched on it a little bit but i, I think i think adopting the roles that we we're given by birth is kind of one way to handle it. That you are a son or daughter or brother, sister, that you can be a father or mother, that you are a community member, that you can belong to various institutions, whether that institution is a book club or, um, or a podcast, <laughs> you know, what, whatever it is. I think engaging with those things. Um, for, it's interesting because for me, I feel like my life is incredibly meaningful on every dimension I could imagine. Um, in, in the familial sense, in the career sense, in the intellectual sense, like everywhere that I could get meaning from, I feel like I'm getting meaning from it. And so like, I don't feel like I'm in a meaning crisis, not, not even a little bit. But all of my interests are kind of tangentially related to meaning. And so that's, that's <laughs> and, and so it's like, you know, I'm studying something completely different and it's like, oh, and that relates back to meaning. And it's like, uh, again, another thing that it relates back to meaning. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. But yeah, <laughs> yeah um, well, and uh, I, uh, from, from my part, um, I, I still keep coming back to Christianity as uh, as a viable um, a viable source of meaning, um, though I I recognize the problems. Right? I mean, I think that's one of the reasons to do theology in the first place is that um, there's this uh, there's this narrative, and then we as humans are trying to understand it and find our place in it. Um, that's one way of understanding theology. Um, and uh, in spite of, um, you know, a lot of the very uh, secularized type of things that um, uh, are discussed on on the podcast, I, I, I'm i a very Christian person. I, I, I kind of think of myself as like a Christian missionary called to a secular world and to speak in its language. Uh, but uh, um so uh, David mentioned recently that uh, there's this kind of uh, legitimacy, le legitimacy crisis for Christianity and that the, the brand has been kind of tarnished uh, recently. And I think that's probably true. Um, and so uh, that's something to grapple with. And I, I don't have a solution uh, to that. Um, but uh, I think that uh, many of the uh, ideas need to be ported in some way um, because, uh, they're valuable and they've been, um, um, well, invalid and, 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 uh, I would argue true as well. Um, uh, I'm probably going to talk with Mike later on, um, about, uh, this idea of, uh, from Adam Miller about porting, um, religious concepts into other domains. Um, this is in the object oriented, uh, theology, which I won't get into now, but, um, the, just this idea that you can you can translate things uh things across um and uh yeah maybe there could even be a kind of crypto uh christianity <laughs> that uh that can give uh uh meaning as well um and and who knows maybe some of maybe some of the things that people are grasping for that don't seem to be all that positive could be redeemed in some ways so like um using nationalism as an example there's there's a lot of uh ways that nationalism is expressed that i wouldn't want to encourage or see proliferate but uh, that's not to say it couldn't be redeemed at all um there are things there that could probably be 
um, uh, developed and uh, directed in ways that would be more pro-social, uh, positive, and even uh, um, internationalist, uh, uh, ironically enough, that, uh, that uh, people could be uh, global citizens while being uh, very dedicated to their own nation states um, at the same time. And that, that's just one example. But uh, yeah, I, I, it just seem, it seems like people are grasping and I want to see, is there something there that people, is there something there that people can use? Does something new need to be created or can we adapt things that are already there to be, to be better for people? Yeah, and I, and I wish I could kind of like export my methods because <laughs> like I feel like what I did worked for me, you know, um, and part of it was, you know, growing up in a religious household and uh, knowing that one day I'd have a family, like working my whole life to get to that point. Um, that the marriage really was kind of this marriage wasn't just like something that you can do if you fall in love or 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 something that like you do once you fall in love it's like no like the, the central mission of my life in many ways is to have a family right and, like that was granted to me by my like a religious upbringing and then like my career kind of like fell in my laps in that like I, I just kind of kept on pursuing what I was interested in and slowly my interest to, my interest got narrower and narrower and narrower until I landed where I, where I am and like uh, you know while thinking in the topics I'm interested in like I get into this kind of flow state where it's just like so fascinating to me like that's meaningful um, and then there's you know kind of this these existential purposes that I've adopted where it was like no one really gave them to me there's just things that like I decided I'm going to do this this is how I want to do things um, you know, you talked about being a missionary to the atheists in a way, um, you know, like, I, I feel like I'm supposed to be in the Mormon community, like, like, that that's like, I feel that that's where I'm supposed to be, and like, I don't know, if, like, I don't know if God himself told me that, and I kind of don't really care in a lot of ways, um, because regardless of whether God himself told me to do it, it's like, he, he at least approves of it, <laughs> but like, this is something I've chosen for myself. Like, that's what I want to do. I want to, that's the community that I want to be a part of and serve. Um, yeah. Kind of almost irrespective of, 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 of the theology of it. Yeah. Um, and it, I, I think the idea of uh, these, because I was thinking, okay, what is the meaning of life? Um, and is there one meaning of life? Uh, you had, you had uh, noted um, on your list of stuff here, uh, moral pluralism, or how did you put it? Um, uh, oh yeah, consequences of moral pluralism. Well, so, um, I mean, it seems like there's at least some room for that, right? But um, what are the limits of moral pluralism or um, are there meanings of life that just aren't gonna, gonna be options or that should be discouraged? Yeah, I think there's definitely some that should be discouraged. Um, being a terrorist is incredibly meaningful. Um, like, that's why people become terrorists. And this is something we haven't talked about, but there seems to be something about, especially young white men, um, but kind of young men in general, that kind of in their late teenage years, early 20s, they're really drawn to certain things. That's when they're most likely to join a cult, most likely to join ISIS <laughs> or other terrorism um, other terrorist groups, you know, it's when they get interested in Jordan Peterson, John Vernicki. <laughs> Dangerous stuff, yeah. <laughs> Dude, quick question, is Vernicki kind of associated with uh, Peterson? Is, is it kind of the same crowd that... Uh... So they're both at University of Toronto, actually. Um, so there is some overlap, and they have done some, like, interviews together. Um, but Peterson's more more culture war right wing where Vermeke kind of uh, I feel is more classically academic yeah yeah I mean it, it's interesting because I mean their their ideas are not I mean I think at the level we're discussing them here they're just interesting ideas they don't have to be associated with all of that but yeah it seems like they they often are so I I will uh, just uh uh divorce myself from all of the baggage <laughs> if there be any from that so we're, we're only interested here in the ideas <laughs> yeah 
uh, but like just the idea, like you know, pe like especially young men in their twenties get really interested in uh, effective altruism, rationalism. Uh, they, they tend to get there's something about a fight club. Um, that age group seems to get really in, into like thinkers with entire worldviews, and I think any time someone gets lost into one of those worldviews too much, into one single worldview, I think that can be problematic. Um, even religion, right? Like you can like there's some people that like they take religion um, <laughs> I, even if you're a christian I, th I think you can understand this and that there's some people that take religion and they and, they, and the way that they apply it it's just like a little bit too fundamentalist a little bit too unforgiving like this is the one worldview and nothing outside my worldview has anything to do with anything and i can ignore it all because this is the one true worldview like i, I think that's always problematic mm -hmm. yeah um i an example I just thought of. So I read this. Uh, well, so Marxism is an example. Um, I think of uh, totalistic theories that are very appealing. Um, and uh, and then Marx himself. I was I read a very good biography on Marx uh, that just gave like all the historical context and stuff um, by Jonathan Spangler or something like that. Um, Sperger. Sperber. <laughs> I, I can never remember his last name. But anyway, um, in uh, one of the earlier chapters where he's talking about Marx's um, adolescence and early 20s, uh, when he's going off to college, he talks about the uh, the cult of uh, Hegel. Uh, so um, Gerhard Wilhelm uh, Friedrich Hegel was just a dominating figure in the 19th century, like uh, cast a shadow over everything, um, especially in Germany. But um, uh, in the intellectual scene, uh, you know, Hegel was it. And, um, uh, and uh, the author uh, reads these stories from these young men who are going to college and getting into Hegelianism. And uh, this one guy writes back to his father and says something like, you know, I, I just feel like, um, you know, the, the, uh, my mind is just opened up and I, you know, see, uh, it's just this revelation of everything makes sense. Uh, and he's really passionate and uh, excited about it. Um, because, uh, and, and I, I do like Hegel, I, I find him interesting. Um, but I see the potential for that because he had a, a very comprehensive philosophy that just um, covered everything and brought everything into a whole. I mean, holism is kind of part of his, his philosophy, uh, kind of a, a pantheism even. Um, but uh, yeah, having, having all the answers to everything, rather than like, I don't know if, um, so Daniel Dennett, for instance, I don't know if there's a cult of Dennett or not, um, because he seems to be one who's like just focusing on little distinctions uh, here and there, you know, just uh, kind of tinkering around with uh, the uh, thought machine uh, and just uh, checking out how it's working and doing some tuning here and there. It's not really a, a total system he's, he's of thought. He's different than Dawkins, right? You know, they're, they're, I, I think they're both considered one of the, you know, four horses of the, of the new, of new atheism, right? Um, but yeah, then it's like tinkering with little small things, whereas Dawkins is kind of like creating this whole worldview for how to think about religion and life. And you, you won't find a lot of people that are like, oh, yes, Dennett. I identify with Dennett. But there's a lot of people that are like Dawkins. Yeah, like Dawkins is like the person that I most identify with in, in life. Yeah, especially, especially uh, back in the day of... Uh... Yeah. yeah, 2005, <laughs> the halcyon days of uh, uh, 2005. Um, I was on my mission in 2005, but <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so uh, okay, so I, I I've been a I've been a proponent of pluralism, but definitely not to the uh, degree where I say like, okay, yeah, terrorism, it's all cool. Uh, I mean, it definitely definitely uh, um, limitations there, um, and I guess that. Um, since I've been reading a bunch of Aristotle, I'll say that uh, that golden mean, right? That um, there are there are ideas that uh, kind of got to find a, a middle point uh, for. Um, so, like, I wouldn't want to say, okay, there probably are universals. Uh, I was going to say, yeah, there's no one standard for all people, but um, I don't even want to say that. <laughs> but um, to say that anything goes uh, is definitely. Um, something I wouldn't want to say on uh, without qualification either. But there's, uh, there's lots of room uh, for people to do different things uh, and maybe even needs to be more. Um, 
like we were saying with capitalism, uh, you know, there are probably uh, life paths that uh, could be, uh, uh, we could clear away some of the underbrush to let people flourish uh, in, in some, some of the life paths that aren't necessarily as encouraged uh, or, uh, or facilitated. Yeah, you know, but trying to like imagine what that looks like, it's always very difficult. Um, you know, I'm thinking of, like, you know, what would, you know, if we were truly moral pluralists, what would that look like? Well, it would kind of look like, you know, the conservatives keep on doing their thing. The conservatives are going to church and they're having families and it's having their 2.5 kids and they're just, you know, doing their thing. And then the extreme leftists, like they're doing their own thing where like the family no longer exists and they're raising their kid as a community. <laughs> and like, like I can imagine it, but I can't imagine it going well. <laughs> um, right. Hard for me to think that like that way of being is like I, morally, like if you, if you can, if it actually is sustainable, like I have no problem with it. I just don't think it's sustainable, right? And so, you know, I, I speak of moral pluralism, like, oh yeah, like we can all go do our own thing and like, you know, have like be the way that we want to be. But like, I, th I think the nature of the universe is such that like some ways are just more tenable than others, right? Mm -hmm. And so we kind of get back like, well, don't we want some kind of constraints? Um, like if people have like bad ideas that have been proven to be bad ideas over and over again, like every community that has tried to like, like, you know, the village raises the child type thing. Um, like, you know, Soviet Russia would try to get rid of the family. And like, it just doesn't go well. So like, do we really allow that? Yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, yeah, and, it, and, and, and that's one of the things is like meaning can be found in many different settings, but they're not all uh, equally sustainable or workable. So like, and, and, and maybe even, uh, the ease of finding meaning something might be more of a marketing question than a, uh, um, like a, a, a reflection of the actual merits of the, of the system that gives it. So like, um, because many of the, many of the ways people find meaning are horrible, <laughs> you know, they're just, um, if, uh, for like being a suicide terrorist, that's not as exactly a sustainable, uh, pattern of meeting, uh, at least at an individual level. Um, and then, um, uh, yeah, so, um, Soviet style communism, uh, definitely, uh, had, you know, a lot of passion mean behind it, uh, revolutionary, uh, communism, Maoist communism. Um, a, a lot of these ideas that, yeah, that just by, at least from the long view, we can see now, okay, that system uh, wasn't workable. There are constraints in reality that make that not workable, but the meaning, the meaning is still there, um, that people, that people find in it. Um, so there, there's two questions. One is, okay, how do you find what is, um, um, going to be a workable narrative? And then how do you get people to find meaning in it? Um, which are, separate but related questions. Yeah, and you know, there's kind of, I think you brought this up, but there, there's kind of like two ways to think about meaning. Like one, you can like find meaning in like your relationships and just like kind of like, like, yeah, in, in your relationships. And then the second one, which is kind of this more existential, like I'm gonna keep like driving towards something. And the driving towards something is incredibly scary in a way. Um, unless you know for sure that you're driving towards the right thing. And like, we should all have epistemic humility in that you're not sure. It doesn't matter what it is, like you're not completely sure. Don't be so sure about a thing like that you're like willing to kill for it, you know? Yeah. Because you're probably not right. You're probably wrong. Um, but like, if, if you can shift meaning towards to being about relationships, like I don't see how that can go wrong. Like it, it doesn't have that same potential for disaster. That's why I like the idea of just like, you know, you're born a community member, you're born a brother, you're born a son, whatever, mm -hmm. like just fulfill your roles. Like those roles, like they come implicit with certain responsibilities, maybe not, you know, granted by the universe itself, but certainly granted by our culture. But yes, cultural constructs, whatever, I don't care. They're still meaningful. And just because they're cultural constructs doesn't mean they're evil or bad or arbitrary. 
like you can still fulfill them and find meaning in that. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we've come, we're coming up on an uh, hour here, at, um, but uh, any uh, other ideas you want to uh, go over before we, before we wrap up? No, I, 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 uh, we can end there. All right. Sounds good. Well, thank you very much for uh, getting together today. I always enjoy it. And uh, I will talk with you later and probably soon. Yep. Thank you very much. See ya.